Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about parallelisms and triasms in Daniel chapter 9. So first of all, what is a parallelism? Let's take a look here at uh, Proverbs chapter 6. And this is, uh, first of all, this is a parallelism right here. These six things does the Lord hate, yes, seven are an abomination to him. So these two lines here are parallel to each other. Like, it's things the Lord hates and things that are an abomination to the Lord. Which abomination is like something that's ugly, hateful, uh, something that you go, ew, you know, like, it's an abomination. It's hor It's an ugly thing. Disgusting. Okay? So, that's a parallelism right there. Now, a chiasm is this. It's another form of a parallelism. And what it is, is this, this certain chiasm has three parallel lines. And then the, there's one, the middle line of it all, is what the main point is, or the most important point. So, it's, you see like a proud look is parallel with he that sows division among the brothers. A lying tongue is parallel with a false witness that speaks lies. Hands that shed innocent blood, that's parallel with feet that are swift and running to mischief. Because it's body parts, right? Hands and feet. That's what makes it parallel. And then the, uh, the heart is the main point of the whole thing. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. That's where it all begins. Because of the wicked heart, all of these other six things come out from a wicked heart. So, a proud look. So these six things the Lord hates. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Feet that are swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And he that sows division among the brothers. So what are the six things? Well, the six things are these three and these three. They are the, parallel, the parallels. And the seven is all of them, including the, the one about the heart. So you get that? that? This is what a chiasm is, is it builds up to the main point and then it descends back down from the main point. Uh, another famous chiasm is in the story of Noah's Ark. You know, in Noah's Ark, the, uh, it starts off with God shuts the door on the ark then the waters rise, the mountains are covered, and then God remembers Noah and all the animals in the ark. So that's the main point, the, the apex of the, of the chiasm. And then when God remembers Noah, it's not that he forgot Noah, but the word remember in Hebrew it can, always, it, it can also mean God turned his attention back to Noah. And um, so, when, so God remembers Noah and all the animals in the ark. And then God sent a great wind from God over the waters. Um, now the word wind is ruach, which can mean a wind or a spirit. It's the exact same word as like in the creation of the world in Genesis chapter 1. The Spirit of God hovered upon the deep. Um, it's the same word, the Ruach of God. So God sent the wind over the waters and the waters receded and then the mountains appeared. So it's the same events in reverse order. And then Noah opens the ark. So that's another chiasm. And that chiasm actually goes a lot further than that. It, it goes about three chapters. Um, but the, 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 
the apex of it is God remembering Noah and the animals in the ark. And the Bible is full of chiasms and parallelisms. There's, there's about seven different kinds of parallelisms, and chiasm is one of them. And uh, there's chiasms embedded within chiasms. There's, there's chiasms all over in the Bible. So you find uh, the book of Daniel is uh, a, a big part of it is written in Aramaic, and another part is written in Hebrew. And it, it's, the people, uh, scholars always wondered why is half of it in Aramaic? And then somebody figured out that the, the entire first half is a, is a chiasm. The whole chiasm is in Aramaic. And then the second half is a chiasm in Hebrew. And so the, the first half, as we've already discussed, is sort of uh, the, the Babylonian king having a dream and, um, and, and Daniel interpreting the dream for the king or with Daniel having trouble with the uh, leaders in Persia and being sent to the lion's den. And, um, but the second half, which is in Hebrew, that, or that half is Daniel's own personal dreams from God. And that part is in Hebrew. So the part in Aramaic is sort of like for the nations, because in the time of Daniel, Aramaic was the, the um, what's the word for it? The language of the land, of all the, the whole kingdom. Kind of like English is the, is a common language. Well, at, at that time in the Persian Empire, Aramaic was a common language. And it was the language of the empirical Aramaic. And um, so that the first half of Daniel is sort of written for the world. And the second half is in Hebrew. It's written for God's people. So you can look at it that way. Now before we go any further, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the video. If you want to see other videos like this, Okay, this is the uh, Daniel's prayer in chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So, he's reading in the book of Jeremiah. This is also recorded in the book of Isaiah, the 70 years. But Daniel doesn't mention Isaiah. He mentions Jeremiah. Now, that, Jer that Jerusalem would be desolate for 70 years, and then it would be rebuilt again. And Daniel is noticing, well, the 70 years is pretty much up. And... Jerusalem is ready to be rebuilt again. So Daniel is uh, praying and fasting for the holy city that, uh, oh God, you know, please rebuild Jerusalem. And um, his whole prayer that he gives is a chiasm. It builds up and up and up. I'm not going to go through the whole prayer. Um, first, because uh, I've already done this, and we're, people are quite familiar with this prayer. You can read it in Daniel chapter 9. And the chiasm builds up and up and up, and the main point is right here of the whole prayer. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us, by his servants, the prophets. So that's like, we have disobeyed, we have nothing, and to God belongs mercy and forgiveness. So we have nothing to give, and God has mercy and forgiveness to give. And that's where they're at, because we'll go through the prayer and we'll learn a bit more about why that is. So we'll start with the beginning chiasm. Okay, 
in the first year of his reign, okay, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So I went to seek the Lord God. So if we continue down here to the other end of it, here's the, the, the parallel at the end of the prayer. O Lord God, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech ye, thee, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, and your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. So it's the same thing. He's praying at the end of the prayer. He's supplicating to God. Okay. Now the next st uh, parallel I prayed to the Lord my God and made my confession. And I said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. So this is, this is the original deal, the original covenant between uh, God and his people through Moses was if you keep my commandments, then I will... Uh, uh, keep the covenant with you. I will be your God, you will be my people. So, what's the parallel at the end of the prayer? It's right here, 15. And now, O Lord, our God, that has brought your people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten you renown, a great name for yourself, as at this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. So they have not kept his commandments. So they have broken the covenant. Okay. And then the next um, parallelism is right here. Verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from your precepts and from your judgments. From the laws. So the parallel of that one is right here, verse 14. Therefore has the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he does, for we obeyed not his voice. Okay, and then, next parallelism, verse 6. Neither have we hearkened unto your servants the prophets, which spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. And that's parallel with 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet we made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. So as it is written, the word of the prophets has come upon them. Okay? And then the next one, verse 7, O Lord, Righteousness belongs to you, but to us confusion of face as at this day, and to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all Israel, that are near and far off, through all the countries where you have driven them, because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against you. Number verse 12, he has the parallel to that, he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil from under the whole heaven, has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. Because he scattered them through many different lands. Right? Then the next parallelism, to Lord, O Lord, to us belong confusion of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. And then it's parallel to verse 11. All Israel has transgressed your law, even by departing, that may, they might not obey the, your voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So the curse is upon them, and they are, the city is destroyed, 
the sanctuary, the temple, the first temple was destroyed, and they are in, uh, they were in Babylon, and now they are in uh, Persia, uh, living in the land of Babylon, or uh, in, well, Daniel was in the land of Persia, I suppose, he was in Susa, but they were living in a foreign land under foreign leaders, and so Daniel's praying for the holy city to be rebuilt. And the main apex of his prayer, right here, to you, God, belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against you, please forgive us. And we have not obeyed your voice, so we earned what we got. But to you belong forgiveness. And you set everything before us by your servants to prophets, and we didn't walk in your laws. Now Daniel, he's a righteous man, but he still cannot keep fully the, the laws of God. He can't go to Jerusalem on the Passover. He can't um, offer the first fruits in the land. He can't. Um, there's no Levitical priesthood. The, the, the whole country is, is, is in a ruin. The laws of Moses are not being kept fully. Um, now, through the prophets, we will find that, um, you know, the, the, it's more important to God to be righteous than to keep his, those precepts. But at the same time, as part of the covenant, those precepts were very, very important. And so now uh, Daniel and perhaps all of Israel is coming to a realization that we rely 100% on God's mercy. That um, there's nothing we can do to fix this. And this is, uh, this is really a part of the new covenant. Okay, this is Jeremiah chapter 31. So Daniel was reading Jeremiah. Jeremiah was uh, a prophet during the destruction of Jerusalem and in a few years leading up to it. Now, so Jeremiah wrote, he's, he's a prophet speaking uh, on behalf of God. Um, okay. We'll start in verse 29. In those days, the, the, some days coming in the future, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. You know how when you eat a sour grape, your teeth chatter? So he's saying our fathers ate sour grapes, and we're paying the price for it. So that's uh, God's feeling of kind of insulted by that. And saying, okay, though you'll no longer have those days, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. And every man that eats a sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. So now every individual will be, will be responsible for their own sins. So God will not withhold it for four generations. Okay? Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So not according to the covenant under Moses, right? Which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord, although I kept the covenant, although God did everything that he was supposed to do, they didn't. Okay, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. After what days? Well, after these certain days that are coming, that, that were coming to them. This happened already for us. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, 
for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. For thus says the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when the waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances, like the moon and the stars, depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Okay, so now we get the idea here that there's a new covenant, not like the old covenant. So you see, Daniel is sort of in between those times. Daniel is here with Jerusalem destroyed, and he's praying for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And the old covenant is broken. It's gone. They can't keep it. There's no temple. It's, it's finished. And Daniel's reading Jeremiah. He must have read about the new covenant too. And maybe having a hard time understanding what it really means. Um, and, but he's praying for God, for to God, for your holy city and your people. So now we're going to now we're going to stop and take a look at the uh, the actual prophecy, the answer that was given to Daniel when he prayed. Okay, and um, it's maybe not as much of a uh, chiasm. It's a bit more loose, I think. Um, but there's definitely a parallels going on in here. Uh, it would take a lot of work to try to sort them out. But I, I did a quick sorting out of it. Um, because you would expect that his, his prayer was a parallelism and a chiasm. You would expect that the answer would be also a chiasm. Okay, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, which is Jerusalem. While I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen at the vision in the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So, Daniel is still recognizing the time of the evening oblation, even though there's no temple and there's no Levitical priesthood to really in action. Uh, he, uh, how are they having an evening oblation? It's not according to the law of Moses, or or what that exactly means. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, and he informed me and he talked with me and he said, Oh, Daniel, now I'm come forth to give you skill and understanding. Okay, now this is a parallel. So what is the skill and understanding? It's in this verse. Now, okay, this verse here is not from any particular translation, it's my own translation. I'm studying Hebrew right now, and there's a few, uh, I'll, I'll sort of talk about it as we go. Okay, he said, okay, now I've come forth to give you skill and understanding. So, if we can understand this, we have the skill to understand, you see? So at the beginning of your supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came to show you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Now you see in this parallel, you should know and comprehend. This is how you will know. And this is the apex of the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed upon your people, now notice he's not saying upon God's people. He's saying upon your people. Daniel's people. And your holy city. Daniel's holy city. You see? The, the, holy pe the people and the city that you were praying about. 
So God has not in this in this uh, prophecy, He's not taking ownership of the city and these people just yet. So Daniel's people and Daniel's city, okay, to end the transgression and to seal up sins and to atone for iniquity and the, and to the bringing in of everlasting righteousness okay so this is for the the forgiveness of sin and everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophet and to anoint the holy of holies now anointing the holy of holies that was in the law of Moses that happened once a year the Holy of Holies, the temple had like two chambers, the inner chamber and the outer chamber. The outer chamber, every day a priest would go in and there was a candles and incense and he would offer incense and light candles. But there's an inner chamber which is the Holy of Holies and that's where the Ark was with the Ark of the Covenant with the law inside of it and the tablets of Moses were inside that Ark and um, Aaron's rod that budded was also inside there and in that chamber nobody was ever allowed to go in there except once a year the high priest would go into that chamber and he would anoint the ark like flip oil on it or, or how, pour oil on it or however they did this function would be to sanctify it and to and his right to do that would be that if he lived and if he made it out of there alive that would mean that God accepted uh, their um, prayers and forgave their sins so it was like the cleansing of like all the the sacrifice of the the cattle and everything all year basically is like gathering all the sins all year and at the end of the year or the certain time of year which would be uh, um, the day of atonement that would be the time when all the sins were cleansed and it was the big high day of the year so this is the the anointing of the holy of holies is the bringing in of everlasting righteousness and the sealing to seal up would mean to place a seal upon to say okay the prophecy is written and now i put my signature it's like signing it you see signing the prophecy and the vision so so to put a to put a signature on the prophecies to say this prophecy is over it's done and now it's signed so that 70 weeks are decreed upon your people and your holy city to end the sins to seal up to place a seal on sins and to atone the day of atonement for the holy holies for iniquity and to bringing in everlasting righteousness and to place a seal upon the vision and prophet and anoint the holy of holies so this is what is being accomplished this is the accomplishment that is happening here in this prophecy this is what this the 70 weeks is for and this is the purpose of the 70 weeks so it's very important to understand this. All right. So now, in parallel with this, that I came to show you and to make you understand, now he says, you should know and comprehend from the going out of a word to the bringing back and building Jerusalem until the anointed one, a ruler, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks so there's seven week period and a 62 week period which equals 69 weeks okay so there's first a 69 week period and then there's a 
one week period after that, which makes 70 weeks. Okay, this chart here sort of demonstrates, I don't know what church this is from exactly, I just found this chart because this chart is sort of uh, how I see it. There's a few different uh, ways of interpreting this that, that it has been done. Um, I think this is the proper way to interpret it. So there's the decree of our tax Xerxes to restore Jerusalem. You'll find that in the book of Ezra. And that happened in 457 BC. So Daniel's vision that he's having here in Daniel chapter 9 is just before this. It's just before the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. There's seven weeks and then 62 weeks. This is the period that we're looking at. There's a 62 in this, this space and the seven weeks here. So for the first seven weeks was a 49 year period when Jerusalem was rebuilt because it took that long because um, they were under a lot of stress from the, the people around them trying to stop them. There was a lot of delays. Uh, there was like an appeal made to the king of Persia. They, had the, they couldn't do any building until the appeal was back and the decree was uh, ratified and they had to go through all that. And then of course building, it, building the temple itself and the city would take a long time. And so uh, they're saying a seven year period is up, goes up to 408 BC and then the uh, 69 weeks would be this period. That's a 483 years, 69 times seven. So that would be from 408 BC until 27 AD. And that was when Christ is baptized by John the, John the uh, Baptist. Okay, so they're saying that's, that happened, and that, that event can be shown in the New Testament. There's, it shows which king was ruling at that time, when John was baptizing in the Jordan, and Jesus came to be baptized. So that happened in 27 AD. We'll talk about this other part in a minute. Now we'll read it again. You should know and comprehend from the going out of the word to bring back and building Jerusalem until the anointed one... That's Jesus Christ, or as uh, people call him, Yeshua. That would be closer to the original Hebrew name, Yeshua. Or the Greek would be like Yesu, Yeshu. From the going out of the word until the appearing of the anointed one. Now the baptizing is a form of anointing. So... Being baptized is being anointed into the kingdom of Christ. And so Jesus accepted that anointing from John the Baptist. Okay? So that, uh, not that he wasn't anointed by God already, but that was a, 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 to a symbolic gesture that set that time when he was anointed. And that is in 27 B.C. Okay, so that's the seven weeks and the 62 weeks from the, the building of Jerusalem and then the waiting until the anointed one. It will return, the city, it will return and be built. Open square, like a plaza. Um, some, Bible, some Bibles will say street, but it really means like an open space, like the market's place. Uh, the, the open plaza of where people meet in the city. So the open square and the wall will be built, but in the distressful times. So people interpret the distressful times as those first seven weeks, the first 49 years, when it was um, very stressful times because people were trying to stop them from building it. Okay. And then after the 62 weeks, so after the long period of time, uh, the anointed one will be cut off, but not for himself. So that's like Jesus Christ was crucified, 
but not for himself, uh, for others, right? For the forgiveness of sins for others. And the coming ruler of a people, this is the one coming after the crucifixion of Christ, the ruler that is coming will destroy the city and the holy place. Now I translated it holy place. This word here is in Hebrew, it, it's just a noun. And it, it, it's a, a noun that says holy, the holy. He will destroy the city and the holy. Um, so it would be the holy place, um, the, which would be the temple. The city and the temple would be a, a, an acceptable way to interpret this. Okay. They'll say the city and the sanctuary, but uh, literally it says the holy place, okay? So you will destroy the city and the holy place, and its end is in the outpouring. So its end would be the, the end of the city is in the outpouring. It's during a time of outpouring. And until the end, the end of the world, the end of the war, the war between good and evil, right? Until the end of the war, desolations are decided upon. So from that time on, the destruction of the city after the crucifixion of Christ, from that time on, desolations are decided upon okay so it's just this here is just talking about the crucifixion of Christ and the, the war between good and evil after that which is talked about in the book of Revelation right so now it comes back and it talks a little bit more about the anointed one I'm going to show you a principle here that is laid out in Jeremiah. And it's one of these judgments by God that kind of um, goes on from then on, even to now, right? So Jeremiah chapter 25, starting in verse 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel unto me, unto Jeremiah. Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Remember Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. You see, so this is the sword. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me to wit Jerusalem and the cities of Ju Judah. So it starts in Jerusalem and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation. Desolations are determined, right? An astonishment and a hissing and a curse as it is this day. So here's the other nations. Pharaoh king of Egypt and his servants and his princes and all his people and all the mingled people, and all the kings of the land of Uz, okay, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon, and Azza, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, these are all like Philistine cities, Edom, and Moab, and the children of Ammon, and all the kings of Tyrus, the kings of Zidon, this is all the Mediterranean coast, uh, the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea, Dedan and Tima and Be Buzz, and all that are in the utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert, and all the kings of Zimri, and all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, and all the kings of the north, Far and near one with another, and all the kingdoms of the all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth. And after all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth drink this cup, 
then after them the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Therefore you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup at your hand, and thou shalt say to them, Thus says the Lord of God, You shall certainly drink. For lo, now here is the principle, For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy against them all these words, and say to them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation, he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the, gate, the grapes against the inhabitants of the earth. Basically, if he's doing it to Jerusalem, it's going to happen to every nation. So this is the desolations that are determined upon the whole earth. Now we see in verse 26 here, um, after all the kingdom, kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth have drank this cup of drunkenness and reeling and desolation, then after, at the end, the king of Shishak shall drink after them. So what is Shishak? Okay, we come all the way to Jeremiah chapter 51, starting at verse 41. How is Shishak taken? And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? See, so Shishak, it's a foreign word that I'm not sure what it means, but it represents the leader of Babylon. And this is Babylon um, among the nations of the whole earth. So this is um, like uh, the end time Babylon. Now, as far as the uh, war, war of good and evil, um, we'll, we'll see that described here in Revelation chapter 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And this is, um, this is uh, talking about the birth of Jesus Christ here, right? The woman, a woman is a church or, or a spiritual group. Um, this woman, this is God's people. It represents God's people. Right? She has the, the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars, which is the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. And she, being with child, cried and gave birth and pain to be delivered and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great, great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Now this re represents the evil empire, right? Which would be Rome, okay? In, during this time, it, it represents Rome. And his tail drew a third of the part of the stars of heaven, and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be, give, to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And that represents the Messiah, that's Jesus. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So after the, the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus was caught up to God. Okay, and the woman, who is the uh, the church, or God, the Israel is God's people. She fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared that they should feed her for twelve hundred and sixty days. We see here Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed prevailed not. Neither was a place found any more in heaven. And the great, great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
So this is an important thing to learn here is that this was accomplished by the crucifixion of Christ. Is this these devils and their angels, the devil and their angels, or the leader of the 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 leader of the fallen angels, they rebelled in heaven, right? And so that by by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, they were thrown out of heaven. Okay? And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come the salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. So he brought forgiveness of sins, right? Now the, the accuser brought brings condemnation. So uh, Jesus brought the opposite. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by believing in Jesus, you, you obtain the forgiveness of sins. And by the word of their testimony, they, they have, every Christian has a testimony. And they love not their lives unto death, because they are willing to face death before they give up Christ, okay? Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devils come down to you having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Okay, so that's the war in the heaven, and, and now it's on the earth. Because now he's cast to the earth, and, and we have to deal with him here. Long. Now this, is in, this verse here is in parallel with this. He informed with me, and he talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. So it's still, so here he is even giving even more skill and understanding. In understanding, understanding this. Okay, this is what we're understanding. We're understanding this. The 70 weeks, right? And what is being accomplished. And transgression, seal up sins, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. So this is like the, the kingdom of God coming to earth, uh, ultimately, right? And the seal up vision and prophet. So he's bringing in everlasting righteousness. This was brought in at the crucifixion of Christ, but it, we have to accept it. So it's brought in but it's not everywhere in the world. It's only in the places where it's been accepted in the world. This is the war. Okay? And to seal up vision and prophet, well, okay, who's a prophet in the Hebrew Bible? Who's not a prophet? Who's a prophet uh, in the apostles? Who's not a prophet? Well, those who... Um, who... attest to... The God is a creator and the giver of the law through Moses and the leader of the nation of Israel and the father of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. That is a prophet. If they don't speak according to that, they are not a true prophet. Okay? Now we're going to look at the final verse. This is more detail about the work of the Anointed One. Okay? He will confirm a covenant to the multitude in one week. And in the middle of the week, He will cause sacrifice and offering to rest. It's, it's the same word, this, the same root as they use to, for the word Shabbat or Sabbath. To cause it to come to a rest, um, is cause it to Sabbath, is what it literally says. He will cause sacrifice and offering to come to Sabbath. Cause, cause it to Sabbath. But it could also mean cause it to end, to come to an end. Like in the, on the seventh day God rested, or on the seventh day God finished his work. So, the, the, the sacrifice and offering has finished its work. It's come to rest. Okay, this is the final week, right? From 27 A.D. until 34 A.D. Now, 34 A.D. 
is recorded in the book of Acts and that's when the stoning of Stephen happened and the Apostle Paul stood by the people's coats as they stoned Stephen and in that same year he he went his name was Saul and he went out against the Christians to to Damascus and that's when he had his vision on the road to Damascus and Peter also had his vision of the uh, sheet coming down with all the um, animals on the sheet saying um, he interpreted it as the gospel going out to the Gentile nations and Paul was the uh, uh, great apostle to the Gentiles so that all happened in 34 AD that began when it was no longer only for Jews it went out to the Gentiles okay so he will confirm the covenant with many the multitude for one week so this week here is the book the four Gospels and the book of Acts or the beginning of the book of Acts is sort of the, the, the Hebrew time of the gospel and after that it goes to the Gentiles also so he will confirm the covenant with the Hebrews the covenant that's going out to the whole world he will confirm the covenant for one week and in the middle of that week he caused sacrifice and offering to cease by, by being crucified he became the only acceptable offering by faith in Christ and that is the uh, message of the gospel that by faith in Christ not by faith in the offering of animals or in faith of doing something it's in believing in Jesus Christ that he was sent by God to do this and by believing that he was sent after all the things that happened through Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the nation of Israel's history that all of that happened and then through those prophets he prophesied Christ and he sent Christ and Christ actually did what he was prophesied to do so in believing all of that, you are entering the kingdom of God. And you should get baptized and be anointed also into that kingdom. So that's the final week. So let's take a look back at the words. In the final week, he will confirm a covenant to the multitude in one week or for one week. He will do it in one week, in one week, because the, cov the covenant goes on forever. It's not only for that week, okay? And in the middle of the week, he will cause sacrifice and offering to cease or rest, okay? Now, when he causes sacrifice and offering to rest, okay, and when, when, when this gospel goes out to the Gentiles, okay, what there's going to be a reaction to that and this is the reaction upon the wing of abominations a desolator okay so a desolator is someone who brings destruction and ruin and he is on the wing of abominations what's that mean so a wing is also can be as a, the edge the wing is, is, is seen as the edge okay in in the Hebrew thought okay so on the edge of abominations well what are abominations in the time of Christ and all the time like right from the time of Babylon right up until the time of Christ abominations in the Bible in the Hebrew Bible the main thing called abominations is the pagan uh, deities the pantheon of pagan gods the polytheism the uh, the worshiping of idols the building of temples to things other than God 
and God um, was totally in control of the building of his temple and God destroyed his own temple and unless God builds his own temple again nobody can build a temple to God but these abominations are building temples to anything that they call a God making idols to gods making up all kinds of different gods these are abominations all right so on the edge it would be like the Roman government was polytheistic okay and they ruled over the Greeks who are also polytheistic they ruled over the Egyptians who are also polytheistic so when they became Christian they um, they mixed mixed the polytheism with Christianity that's why they have a million saints that's why they have uh, all these statues and all these customs Th those are Roman customs they're Egyptian and Babylonian and Greek and Roman customs Rome kind of absorbed all of those customs uh, from those other nations as well as their own and that's what we have now in Christianity today Roman customs so the wing of abominations a desolator so who's the desolator okay well who's the one the ruler who comes a rule the coming ruler of a people will destroy the city and the holy place. Well, who did that? Rome. They destroyed the, the temple in 70 AD and, and the city. So the desolator who destroyed the city and the temple will go on desolating. Okay? Right until the time of the end is the desolator. It's the iron beast that crushes everything in its path. The final beast. Okay? And until the end, what is decided upon? Well, what is decided upon? Desolations are decided upon right here. Desolations are decided upon. So, until the end, what is decided? Desolations. <laughs> shall be poured upon the desolated no actually that should be that should be the desolator see this is a participle huh why is it doing that Okay, the desolator. So this is a participle in Hebrew. So it can only be a noun or a verb. The des when it's a noun, it is the one doing the action of the verb. It's not the subject of the verb. Okay, so it would be the desolator. And if it's a verb, it would be desolating. So it doesn't make any sense to be a verb. Okay. Until the end, what is decided shall be poured upon the desolating? No, it's poured upon the desolator. You see? So the desolations, so it's like every time the desolator is destroying something and ruining something, he's destroying himself and he's ruining himself. That's the point, you see? And, and we are all stuck in it watching it happen as Christians and we sometimes are being destroyed by it as well right like physically but not not um, it's not taking away our eternity but taking away our body or our lives right because it's a it's a it's a desolator at work right but the, the, the desolator is also destroying himself. So what is decided? So whatever you do to others shall be done to you. You know? So um, it comes up in Revelation where you'll see, 
and God remembered Babylon and brought upon her all the things that she did to others like that kind of idea so uh, it's, it'll be shall be poured so these things are being stored up all these desolations that the desolator is doing until the end and what is decided the desolator the desolations shall be poured upon the desolator so that's the end is when all the desolations the desolator did shall be poured back upon the desolator something like that so now here is Revelation chapter 18 verse 1 to 5 this is talking about the Babylon at the end of time just to show you where it appears in Revelation after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying Babylon the great is fallen now this Babylon the great is the the evil empire at the end of the world right and it's become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication now her fornication um, this this language is used in the Old Testament speaking about the nation of Israel worshiping foreign gods they're fornicating with foreign gods so this is like a church worshiping foreign gods so all nations drunk of that that wine that that her doctrines her teachings that worships foreign gods and the kings of the earth committed fornication with her so they they joined in with this whole scam right and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abund abundance of her delicacies so this this evil empire is r running trade and 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 political power along with all these false gods uh, mixed with the true God so that's basically what it is okay and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that you are not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues because she's going to drink the cup last she's going to be the last one to be desolated but she's causing the desolation of all the others and then in the end what is determined shall be poured upon the desolator so there it is is that come out of her and don't join in with this world empire religious empire and uh, her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities reward her even as she rewarded her you and double to her double according to her works in the cup which she filled filled to her double see so there's the cup the, the cup of reeling right which she desolated all the others and now it's going to pour to be poured upon her and we can see it now we can see the, the lies being perpetrated and uh, it's all about control of people and control of the world and the actual evil Babylon is not out in plain sight you have to look at all the clues where the Bible reveals who this actually is okay to sum up here we're going to take a look at uh, something from the New Testament from the Apostle Paul this is the book of Galatians chapter 3 starting in verse 17 he's explaining the new covenant this is uh, going back to what Jeremiah prophesied right and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God 
in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, that's 430 years after the promise. So the, the covenant of Moses, made under Moses, right? It was confirmed before of God in Christ. So the promise to Abraham was a covenant of faith. And the covenant that came after, the law that came after from Moses, 430 years later, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Therefore, what is the law for? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was, now who's the seed that comes? That's Christ. Okay, so the law was added um, to bring about the circumstances that led to the prophesying of Christ and to the bringing of Christ. So it was all part of the plan. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, which the mediator was Moses, right? Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. But righteousness, but the law brought the breaking of a covenant. It didn't bring righteousness. Right? But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, um, now, the, now, we keep the law still by faith, but the law is not what gives us life. The law is what keeps us alive. The law is what keeps us under, uh, in God's kingdom. Um, but the law does not impart life. The law imparts death for breaking the law. You see? So we were kept under the law, as, as like a teacher, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Therefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to show us that we need forgiveness, and to bring us to um, bowing before God and, and, and Him then it, through faith imparting his righteousness into us. Now the law describes his righteousness. But we can't do it on our own. We can only do it through faith in God and God imparting it to us. The ability to do it. That we might be justified by faith. Because you have to be justified or cleansed before you can keep the law. And it's through Christ that we get that cleansing and that ability to, to walk in the law. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, right? But it's still the same law. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ. For, but there's no guilt. There's no burden here, right? For as many of you has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So some people will say that he's speaking against the law. He's not speaking against the law. He's speaking against the law imparting righteousness. 
The law doesn't impart righteousness. The law defines righteousness. But it is imparted by faith. Or righteousness is imparted by faith. It is defined by the law. So one more thing I wanted to discuss regarding the 70, 70 weeks is another way to say 70 weeks is 70 sevens. Okay? So if we look over here, we see the, these are the holidays of um, God as, as given through Moses. And uh, they're discussed in Leviticus chapter 23, if you want to look them up. And we see here there's the Passover, which coincides with the crucifixion. Jesus was crucified on the Passover. And then there's a, a time of 49 days. And that, that is called the Feast of Weeks, where they wait 49 days. And then the end of that is the day of Pentecost. And that is the day when the apostles were in the upper room and they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So that 49 days, that's seven sevens. Seven times seven is 49, right? So that kind of, that number shows an importance where 70 weeks is 490 days. So it's 10 times the 49 days. So the, it, there's a number play going on here. It's an important number, okay? And there's no gap in that. It's a 49-day period. But it's playing out in years, and it's 10 times. So those things um, all come into play. Now, the other thing, just before we go, the other thing I want to show you is uh, one more thing regarding the 70 times 7. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times 7. Therefore, now because of this, therefore means because of this, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for, him, for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So he was forgiven. But then the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, a, a dollar. <laughs> and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after all that he had called him, and then his Lord, after all that he had called him, said to him, O oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you asked me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was mad and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do to you if you from your hearts do not forgive everyone his brother in their trespasses. So there's a good lesson 
uh, regarding the 77s, the 70 weeks. Okay, well, I hope I made some sense in that along the way. It gets quite deep, so it's, not, it's hard not to get lost and go down rabbit holes sometimes. So, I thank you for watching, and uh, again, I ask you, you to subscribe and hit that like button. Um, it always helps out with the algorithms and keeps the channel moving along. And I thank you, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.